MSNBC columnist, uh, Dave Zirin, who works for The Nation oh. most of the time. He's written a guest column, you know, and Dave is to the left of Karl Marx. Uh, he's written an MSNBC <laughs> column complaining that NBA fans <clears throat> aren't cheering loud enough for <clears throat> Brittany Griner. He's very offended, and he, in his column, he talks about how the, you know, Utah Jazz or fans are known for their brutal treatment of black athletes, and when they announced, mm. they put Brittany Griner up on the big screen, I guess, at a Jazz uh, game, and we want to welcome her home, and allegedly there were a smattering of boos, and Dave was, I think, talking about, uh, he was at maybe a Wizards game where you know, they reintroduced John Wald and there were loud cheers, uh, but their cheers weren't as loud for Brittany Griner and he's upset about it. And I'm like, hey man, you do know she took a dump all over America and said this country uh, is racist and oppressive and she's ashamed of the national anthem. It's not all that surprising that traditional American sports fans aren't, you know, <clears throat> just overjoyed that we traded the merchant of death for some woman who doesn't even appreciate America, but Dave's very upset and it's a sign of just how racist and unfair America is that we're not cheering lustily for uh, Brittany Griner. Okay, it, my response to Dave Zirin would be very simple. This is my trademark line. Yeah, and th this is the issue that I have with columnists like him. And, and Dave Zirin, every time he pops into my Twitter feed once in a while, he does give me a good chuckle. I mean, it's ha-ha, but not in a funny way. The issue is, Dave, if you care about Britney, that's fine. That is absolutely your prerogative. But your overwrought whining and complaining about how everyone should agree with you and be in lockstep with your thoughts, that's where I think we've lost it. Like, every time I write something, no matter if it's controversial, incendiary, uh, out there, whether it's the hottest take of all time, I actually don't expect anyone to agree with me. Now, everyone should if they have a modicum of intelligence, but I understand the world that we live in. And it just comes off as you have to agree with me or I'm just going to cry. And that's all that he does nowadays. Dave Zero and I used to enjoy. I believe that he had a, a regular column or still does called Louder Than a Bomb for Slam Magazine, which I subscribed to for years. And there was a time I actually enjoyed his writing, but now he has gone into this uh, industrial complex of white guilt. And, you know, everything is the white guy. He's the cool guy. He'll be invited to the barbecue. He gets it. He understands it. Um, but I, I would ask him, how many WNBA games did you cover? Uh, in fact, before all of this, I, I would like to ask how many cover stories on Brittany Griner did he pen? And, and by the way, um, who was that? Yeah, Andy Warhol. He called me. Yeah, yeah, special line, Andy Warhol. He just called me, and I said, what's going on? Yeah, Brittany's 15 minutes? Yeah, Steve, it's over. And what did we say? Now, last week we talked about it a little bit, right? It's almost like it didn't exist because we really don't care. But that's, that's my biggest gripe with Dave is not even his own opinion. He has the right to think America – is this vile, evil, racist country. Even though uh, every day streams of people, all sorts of people from all across the world are fighting to get into America, which I've always found interesting. But to, to actually emotionally extort everybody else to feel sorry for someone who seemed to be a perennial malcontent, that's where, again, he completely loses me. Dave Zyron. I'm just going to keep it a thousand percent. You said it's Fearless Friday. Dave Zyron's not a white guy. He's oh, a not? Jewish guy. Oh, oh, who, oh, he's oh. a Jewish guy who oh. thinks it's his job to police the thoughts and all the activity around black people. That's his job. That's what he does. And so he's trying to, he, he's, he doesn't actually like mm -hmm. white people. And he, he, he wants to d demonize America and use black mm. people to demonize America and he's using Brittany Griner mm. and he's used his relationship with some uh, you know Eton Thomas who you know 
I don't think I ever scored more than five points a game in an NBA game or certainly didn't average, average that. And, and so he and Eton are the Batman and Robin of vilifying white supremacy. And, and if he can find a Brittany Griner or anybody to use to further his narrative that America is terrible and, and uh, th- that's what he's going to you know, do. You know what's interesting? Uh, the guy's it, a joke. He, yeah, he, he this, tried to forget. Let me just be completely yeah. transparent. You know, for years, he's been one of my biggest critics and stalkers and running around trying to tell me what I should think. And I've never liked or respected him uh, because he, he can't control what I think, write, say. He's, he, you're not, I get you're the overseer for Eton Thomas and some of these other black dudes that ain't got no balls and don't have a brain for themselves. But they uh, miss me with that, and I'm not going to feel bad because I'm not overjoyed that Brittany Griner is home. She don't care nothing about America. I didn't care about her when she was over here playing basketball. I'm not going to, you know, run around yeah. and fake and pretend like I'm overjoyed that we gave up the merchant of death for some woman who didn't even appreciate being an American. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm no. honest about this. <laughs> if a WNBA game was taking place in my backyard, I'd close the drapes. And if that game involved Brittany Griner, <laughs> I would just leave the house and go to lunch. And, but, but that, and like, it, everyone feels this way, but they won't say it. It, it reminded me of one of your other old nemesis, old Katie Kate Nolan. She went on this rant one time, and, it's, and I saw a video and where she talked about how the WNBA does deserve equity with the NBA. She made this big spiel. And then someone actually went to her social media. I think it was her Instagram account. And she's had a lot of games. Red Sox, Patriots, any male league she was at. You know what they didn't have one picture of? Her at any other WNBA event. That That is the hypocrisy. It, it is, is, is a classic case of do what we tell you, but not what we do. atheist, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take, shut up. You, you're, you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men we know you're imperfect, you know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy, mercy gives you the right to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture, and we, we have to do that. You can look around and say, these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president. Is transgender surgery for children? Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're gonna stop fighting today and you're gonna let the government raise your kids and you're gonna turn around and let them chop off your 12 year old daughter's breasts and let them sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl and you're gonna let them make the Bible hate speech. You're the last line of defense here because nobody else is gonna do it and God's gonna walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. I'm telling you, so it's like everybody, it's a nice little metaphor, this is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedroom. And there are all types of people that are trying to climb up in the ladder. And every good father should be on his post so that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know you, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying, no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough. In prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ. I appreciate that, but to have Jesus pray for me, that makes me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, 
go back and strengthen your brothers. So we all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folks out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone, be confident in your positions, and we're gonna inspire you. We're gonna eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's gonna be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're gonna put out our best uh, recruiting pitches for soldiers. <laughs>